it, it's a pleasure to be here at a Patsos meeting after many years and to have an opportunity to say a few words to a group concerned with opening the doors of policy making in Central Asia and the Southern Caucasus. This is a challenging neighborhood uh, in this regard, to say the least, and working in this domain and these regions is not for the faint-hearted or impatient, and you have to be commended for your efforts. In my remarks, I want to step back a little to try to understand the business that we are in, to say something about the narrative of the undertaking and see how the various actors fit in. This is a region where the legacy of the Soviet period weighs far more heavily than elsewhere in the post-communist space. It has no neighbors who can serve as examples of liberal democracy. There is no EU accession process or aspirations, and thus no EU membership-driven imperatives to reform. The drive for reform will have to be internally driven, and the impetus, most likely, will be successive crises that authorities are unable to resolve without changing the paradigm of how they govern. The road ahead is going to be a very hard one. Policy making that you are engaged uh, the topic of this uh, conference presupposes that there is a policy process that enables actors to have inputs. And here the communist legacy weighs heavily because under that system there was no policy process because all decisions were made in the corridor of the Central Committee. There were decisions, but there was no decision-making process. It was a closed system of hierarchical management where planning was a widespread social game based on profound dichotomy between real rules and official ones. In reality, local controlling groups tried to maximize their share of the Soviet pie. Although the Soviet Union was often called a bureaucratic behemoth, in reality, its administrative machinery had none of the characteristics one associates with a classical bureaucratic organization. Written communication, promotion and selection based on technical merit, and certainly there was no accountability system. All of this led to a situation where the real heritage of communism was not a hierarchical, disciplined public sector with a distinctive culture and ethos, but a chaotic free-for-all where bureaucrats responded to pressure from top leaders, where the distinction between public and private spheres was blurred and state power easily captured in pursuit of private interest in wealth, and where the personal preference of the top leader is the key criteria in making a decision, and there are no systems in place to carefully analyze the merits of a course of action. This system suited powerful interests because it allowed the wholesale stripping of public assets after privatization and gross corruption that allowed fortunes to be accumulated. If you survey the policy outcomes of this system after 1991, it accomplished, for better or for worse, for three things. It accomplished privatization, it accomplished liberalization, and it accomplished macroeconomic stabilization. This was completed, by and large, by 1998 in most countries. What's characteristic about these achievements is that they could be accomplished with very few administrative staff and that these problems were not analytically complex and that they required a minimum of procedures. For example, macroeconomic stabilization 
could be done by three people, the head of a central bank, the minister of finance, and the political support of the president or prime minister. <clears throat> but these systems have not been able, have not been capable of dealing with a single major issue confronting society, such as reform of social welfare, education, or the creation of a regulatory environment and incentive system for quality economic growth or the elimination of intolerable levels of poverty. The imperative for Central Asia is economic growth. In 2009, the gross national income per, per capita in purchasing power parity for Tajikistan was $1,950. That is on par with Senegal. In Kyrgyzstan, it was 2,200, roughly the same as the Republic of Congo. While Kazakhstan, with its hydrocarbon and mineral wealth, is now a lower and middle income country with 5,840 per capita. This is less than Tunisia with 7,820. And, and Kazakhstan, has to address serious issues of regional inequality. A recent 2011 study of regional inequalities in Europe, Latin America, and Central Asia found that Kazakhstan had the highest level of inequalities where there are entire oblasts that live, where the population lives on under three or four dollars a day. But of course, Central Asia is not the third world because it has human endowments. Kyrgyzstan's tertiary enrollment rate is 52%. That is the number of people of the age group that go to university. That is higher than Austria's. The challenge is to apply the human endowments that are much more robust than the GDP capita, uh, per capita figures would suggest to spur economic development, and this is one of the most pressing questions of the day. The command system inherited from the Soviet period that in some modification exists today is not suited to deal with the difficult and pressing issues. There are many reasons for this. I think one very important reason is that today's social economic problems of the post macroeconomic stabilization and productization period are very analytically complex. If someone thinks that it is easy to do something like social welfare reform in the countries, they are profoundly mistaken. Moreover, they, these policies are very difficult to implement and they require a corpus of trained civil servants civil servants to administer. The cry of a recent former speaker of the Kyrgyz parliament, give us dictatorship so we can have growth, will simply not work. It has been tried and failed. Progress on pressing issues can only be made if public policy becomes a paradigm in the work of government, not more dictatorship. Opening the doors of policy making is precisely what is needed. Even modest steps at local levels would help. The recent introduction in Kyrgyzstan of citizen supervising councils and ministries offers considerable promise. So what then is the public policy paradigm and why is this paradigm important? Citizens can expect many things from their government. But at the very least, they are entitled to have intelligent decision making. And that these decisions and that these decisions flow from some general position or vision. Unfortunately, governments in our region can be very decisive without being terribly intelligent. Intelligent decisions come from operating within some consistent framework. The very nature of intelligent and accountable govern governance in a democracy means that 
it means more than mere decisions. It demands decision making that is guided by the best evidence available and the framework. In short, we demand that our government have policies. These policies should operate within a policy framework that is understandable by the population and becomes the subject of scrutiny and debate. These frameworks make individual decisions intelligible to the public. <clears throat> a public policy approach to government decision-making therefore means many things. It means that there are analytical units in government that are engaged in research, analysis, and evaluation in dealing with issues, that are engaged with the development of evidence-based policies. No, no government in this region actually is engaged in evidence-based policies. First of all, because they don't gather evidence, and secondly, they don't have the staff who knows how to gather evidence and make that kind of analysis. So one moves from one decision on health to another decision on health without any evidence. This is the case even in some reform-minded governments. Um, I lived in Ukraine for many, many years and worked in government, and when we had a reform government, we did a functional review of the Ministry of Finance. It prepares the budget. That is the main instrument of public policy. This is a place where you would expect some policy analysis to occur. And we found that only 4% of tasks performed by the staff involved analysis, and 0% of the time was spent on the kind of analysis that ministries of finance around the world spend an awful lot of time, namely analyzing the efficiency of public spending. Zero percent. With ministry officials drowned in detail, putting out fires, how can anyone engage in a meaningful policy discussion with them on proposals for a more effective use of public funds? How can one conceivably have adequate and forward-looking policies? The public policy paradigm is also about a new way of working in government. It involves a policy process with defined cycles of policy development, such as agenda setting, policy formulation, policy adoption, policy implementation, policy assessment. The difficulty you face in opening doors of policy making is that there is no recognizable policy process as such. In fact, people in government can't tell you what the process is. Many, many times you ask people how did this decision arrive at, and they don't know. Somebody arrived at it. Having a, uh, but today's problems are of course so complex that they require more than willful decisions. Having a policy process, by the way, is also a good way of working out competing interests and building coalitions in support of policy. Having an interest and lobbying for your interest is not a sin. It is a normal part of how democracy works. But in our region, interests are individually lobbied behind closed doors, and if that doesn't work, they take more violent forms. The recognition of the legitimacy of interests and providing a process for the reconciliation is one of the more important tasks facing the region's policies. Politics. Public policy is also about policy analysis, something that you are engaged in. At its most basic, the endeavor called public policy is all about the application of knowledge and intellect to public problems. It has become a developed and specialized intellectual activity using a variety of instruments such as benefit-cost analysis. It is concerned about the systematic evaluation of alternative means of achieving social goals. 
policy analysis is not political marketing or consultancy because it is based on rigorous analysis. Neither is it academic research because it is concerned with making practical recommendations and it's actually driven by a political agenda that is opportunities to change policy. Policy centers and think tanks play an important role here as the main bridge between power and knowledge. If these policy centers become islands of excellence, applying full-time scientific thinking to an in-depth improvement of policy making. But the bridge between power and knowledge has to be created. And one of the ways of creating it is the sort of thing that I think that you did in Istanbul, and much more of this has to happen, and that is to have civil servants and analysts go through the same professional development opportunities. So as you consider the further work that needs to be done, this talk is a special plea for attention to the policy process. Unless a process is in place, it will be virtually impossible for civil society actors to engage in policy work to find a point of entry to influence a given policy. One should consider working with any level of government to try to achieve this. Also, one of the most unresearched topics in policy analysis is policy mapping. Who influences what area of policy and how decisions are arrived at? I realize that this kind of research can be risky, but in the policy business, policy mapping is very important if the end objective is not just to write a paper that remains on the shelf, but that it actually has some sort of impact. And moreover, not all policy areas carry the same risks. In the end, I wish you all the best in your work and success in this country.